You're listening to the Gospel of Mark, a series preached by Pastor Dan Christians at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Welcome back to Sunday night service. Yeah! So, I learned, I learned a trick. Um, I went to the Christian school, uh, and I did chapel there, and before, like when I went up and Andrew introduced me, they all clapped. And I thought, you can get a round of applause when you preach as long as it happens before you open your mouth. <laughs> so, good job. Thank you. I will remember that. Uh, I am grateful that you've come tonight. Uh, I have honestly not missed the anxiety of the Sunday afternoon, getting ready for service and knowing that I was going to preach. I, I haven't missed that. I have not missed the freedom that comes with no Sunday night church service. But I've missed the sense of community, the sense of family that we have here. I've missed the opportunity to uh, myself really delve into scripture and study it and prepare a message and then the opportunity to open it up together and to get into it. Uh, and I've missed just looking from here and seeing all of your beautiful faces, even if it's only half of them. And so I am looking forward to tonight and to being back on Sunday evenings. Uh, the goal here tonight is to worship together as a church family, to sit under God's word, and then to set some time aside to pray at the end. And so I'm hoping to be shorter tonight. I'm planning to be shorter tonight. Um, we are going to jump right back into where we found ourselves last in Mark chapter 10. And that's a little bit unfortunate because I believe the Spirit of God directed Mark to include these four stories that we, that we find in Mark 10 together for a reason. These four stories, though each of them can stand on their own, all speak about different people coming to Christ. First, you have the children who come to Christ and they have nothing but simple faith and they're received. And then you have the rich man who comes to Christ with his riches, his wealth, his piety, his, his righteousness. This is a good and sincere man. And he leaves without Christ. He leaves empty because he wouldn't let go of his stuff. Because he, he wouldn't let go and recognize his, his more desperate need for a Savior. And then now, tonight, we'll look at the disciples coming to Jesus and they want position. They want something from him. And then finally, we'll look in a few weeks at a blind beggar who comes to Christ. And I think all of these work well together in chapter 10 to, to teach us the right posture that we come to Jesus with. The problem is, it's been six months since we started chapter 10. And it'll probably be another six months before we finally finish. No, it won't be that long. But it'll be a little while. And so... Uh, we want to begin tonight reading from Mark chapter 10, and we'll begin in verse 32, and I think it's helpful to set the scene in our minds so that we can get the most out of the text. And so Jesus has challenged the assumptions of the culture and the assumptions of the disciples when he allowed the children to come, and then he pronounced, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. This is shocking. See, you judge the children unworthy, and I'm here to tell you that that's the only way you can be worthy, the simple faith of a child. And immediately after, Jesus shocks the culture again, the disciples again, when he finds the rich young ruler, a seemingly good, moral, sincere man, unworthy of the kingdom of God. And so the man that everybody lifted up and said, surely this man is worthy, Jesus says, not like that, he's not. He must come like a child. Now the disciples and Jesus leave from this place, and for the last time they head toward Jerusalem. And I don't know what your response is to hearing that children get in, but moral rich men don't. But this is what it did to the twelve. Look at verse 32 of Mark chapter 10. The Bible says, and they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. 
So there's two responses we get from the disciples after these events transpire. The first is that they're amazed, and the Greek word is thembeo, which is, it's not such a word like they were in awe of Jesus. That's not really the idea here. It's more like they were stupefied by, like they were bewildered by. As they watched what Jesus did and the way he interacted and what he was teaching, they were completely baffled. They were amazed in that they didn't fully understand or grasp what just happened. But the very next response is, they were afraid. And again, this this fear, it's not a fear of terror. It's not like you'd be afraid of something that is unkind or mean. It's more a fear of reverence. That they were afraid. So even though they didn't fully understand, they were baffled by Jesus' teaching, they were also still in awe of him. And to be honest with you, I think this is kind of a good place to be. I think there should be some times that we're in the Bible and we're like, God, I don't understand you, but I'm in awe of you. I I don't get what you're saying, but I fear you. I revere you. That's where the disciples are at. And we, I want to say that good about the disciples because everything else I say about them is going to be pretty bad. <laughs> and so we should start on a good note. We are, we are like the disciples, so maybe it makes us feel better. Sometimes we get it right. Verse 32 continued. It says, And he took again the twelve, and he began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered. Before we talk about what he's going to be delivered to, I want us to really understand who we're talking about. Because what Jesus is about to tell them is far more shocking than anything that just happened. It's more amazing than they can begin to comprehend. So if there's anything we want to dwell on tonight, it's who is going to do what he's just about to talk about him doing. And so they are physically heading toward Jerusalem. In fact, the Bible often speaks about them going up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was an elevated city. It was very high up. So no matter which place you came from, you you went up to Jerusalem. And so I imagine that as these events are transpiring and as they're walking behind him, Jerusalem is in the distance. They can see the lights on the horizon. They can see what's going on. Maybe not the details of the town, but they know where they're going toward. And he says... The Son of Man shall be delivered up. Now, the first question I have is, why does Jesus choose that title? Because it's interesting that Jesus actually refers to himself as the Son of Man more often than any other title that he gives himself. So why that title? It would seem to indicate that he's just a man, wouldn't it? He's the Son of Man. Just like we could all call ourselves the Son of Man. But this is not what Jesus means. The title is given to the Messiah in Daniel chapter 7. And these verses are so good, I want us to turn there real quick. And so we're going to read Daniel chapter 7, starting at verse 13. The scene here in Daniel 7 is the final judgment of the world. And so the sinful and the unbelieving are judged, and the saved are rewarded and granted eternal life. Daniel 7, starting at verse 13, says... I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him, the Son of Man, dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. And so yes, when we look at the title Son of Man, at first glance we see the humility in that title. And I think there is humility and there is humanity there. But it's also this veiled reference to the eternal King of Kings. So as he says it, he's saying, I am the Son of Man. I am the humble one, the human that will come and die. But I'm also the one who will one day have dominion and power that I'll be Lord over all things and all people, and everything that exists, exists to serve me. Which is amazing. It's his subtle way of declaring himself both God and man. And so this God and man, this one who spoke all things into existence, for whom all things exist, 
is the one who's about to say what's going to happen to him. Let's look at verse number 33, the second part. The Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and they shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. It is amazing that Jesus predicts his own death with incredible detail and accuracy. It's an amazing thing to think that he's, he's actually, it's almost as if it's already happened and he's looking back and he's seeing it and he's telling them what happened, except it hasn't happened yet. It's ahead of him. But what's more amazing is that they're walking toward it. That Jesus is saying, this is exactly what's going to happen to me as they step toward Jerusalem, and Jesus is leading them there. He knows what awaits him. And there's a word, I learned it, it's polysendenton. It's when you use and, 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 because you're trying to, to bring detail to every single phrase, and you're trying to kind of build upon it. And so do you notice the polysendentons in this, in this text? He says that he shall be um, delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and they shall deliver him up to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and they shall scourge him, and they shall spit upon him, and they shall kill him. Every single one, it just gets worse and worse and worse. It is speaking of the inevitability of what awaits him. His freedom will be taken from him. He will sit trial before pompous religious men who have been looking for a chance for three years to put him to death. They will attempt to put him on trial, but when that fails, they will condemn him anyway. They will bring him, the Gentiles, to Pilate, the one with the power to see the execution through. The Son of Man, the one who will one day be given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages shall serve him. The one at whose name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father would be mocked. That he would be stripped naked for all to see. That they would plate a crown of thorns on his head. They would put on him a purple robe, give him a staff, and make fun of him that he would be publicly humiliated, that he would be scourged, that he'd have his body shredded to pieces uh, with rocks and bones and other sharp objects as they're plunged in and then torn back out, that he would be spit upon. Like, spitting is just a gross thing. It's something you, you don't do to dogs. And yet they would take the Lord of heaven and earth and spit on him. And then he would be crucified, murdered as a criminal between two other criminals. But do you notice the final and? Because in this story, after man has done his worst, God gets the final and. And he will rise again from the dead. Men would do their worst and then God would act. In Acts 2.24, Peter was speaking, he was preaching, and he said, God raised him up because it was not possible that death could hold him. I love that thought, that it wasn't, there's never a chance that Jesus could ever die and stay dead because of who he is. He is the king, so he must rise. And so, let's get this straight before we look at the response. The disciples are following their master, and they're in awe of him, and they don't fully understand him. But he is the one that Peter is now declared to be the son of the living God. He is the Messiah. They've admitted that he has the words of eternal life, that there's no one else to turn to. And now he's just said that he would be delivered, condemned, spit upon, scourged, mocked, and killed, and then rise again. If this is you, how do you respond to Jesus as he says these things? Actually, for the third time. This is the third time he's predicted that this would happen. How do you respond? Let's see how they responded. Verse 35, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, saying, Master, 
we would that thou should do for us whatever we desire. And he said unto them, what would you that I should do for you? I guess I got to, I wish I was there to hear the tone that Jesus had when he said that. What, what do you want, what do you, what do you want me to do? Here they come to him and they say, Jesus, you know what? I'm so glad to hear about that last part. You're going to rise again because we really got something we need you to do for us. We, we want you to promise that you're going to do this thing for us. And so after he tells them what will happen to him, all that, that, will, that lays before him that he's going to go through for their sake, they say, we just want you to do something for us, though. And so, they miss the gift completely. They miss everything that Jesus just said. That Jesus was about to suffer for them. That everything that he was about to go through would be so that they didn't have to. So that they could have an escape from death. What is given to us in Jesus' death? What is the gift? And if I was to ask you this question, I think that we'd probably all have some really good answers. And I'm sure that I've missed a few good answers in this. But I want to tell you what I wrote down when I started thinking about what was given to us in Jesus' death. Forgiveness, redemption, mercy, pardon, inheritance, adoption as children of God, uh, salvation, Eternal life, grace, peace with God, reconciliation, the righteousness of Christ, a home in heaven, hope, fullness of joy, justification, freedom, victory, acceptance, love, a new heart, a new citizenship, access to God's throne, to be children of God. And I think the list could go on and on. A while back, we were singing the song, Here is Love. It was while we were in, in the auditorium. And we came across one of the new verses that says, Here is love, vast as the oceans, countless as the stars above, are the souls that he has ransomed, precious daughters, treasured sons. And it was one of the times that I was singing that song, and as I was singing precious daughters, treasured sons, it just happened that Andy and Katie were sitting close to the front row. And I looked down at Andy and Katie, and I, and I don't, like, it just was like, precious daughters and treasured sons. And that, that, that wasn't just like a song then that I'm singing. It was like looking at people who are now daughters and sons of the King of Kings. And ever since I've done that, and it, I mean, it, I know you don't believe it, but it choked me up a little bit. <laughs> it happens every once in a while. I'm really good at hiding it. So, Every time we sing a song now, when we come to that line, I, I try and find people. Often it's my kids, to be honest. But I try and look at certain people and think of them as daughters and sons of God. And so what is given in Jesus' death? That we can sing a song like this and talk about the love of God. This is love, that we're sons and daughters of God. That we have redemption and forgiveness and all those things I just mentioned. That's a pretty good list. That's pretty amazing. I mean, everything that matters, I think, is encapsulated in that list. And their response is, yeah, Jesus, but we want you to do one more thing for us. He has given them everything. Romans 8.32, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He gave us the greatest thing. That's what, G that's what Paul is saying there, that God who gave us everything, I mean, what else do we have to ask for? How shall he not give us freely all things? We've got everything in Christ. And so here is our thought for tonight. Here is the devotion, because we've got to wind down quickly, okay? And so I want us to get this thought. I was reading these verses, and I, I got to the point where they asked the question, Jesus, we have one more thing we want to ask from you. And I just thought, how often do we have one more thing we need from Jesus? How often is that list that I just spoke about insufficient? 
that there's more that he must do for us. And we are so focused on some temporal problem. I'm not trying to diminish temporal problems because there are serious problems that people go through. But we become so myopically focused on this thing that's going on in our lives that we miss all the gifts that he's given. Like the gift that he's given. We wish we were healthier. We wish that we had a better job or better circumstances. We wish that we were better looking or had more money or more friends or more recognition or better marriage or better kids. Or kids wish they had better... I mean, the list can go on and on and on. And, I'm, and really, there are lots of good things that we should pray about in our lives. We're, we're commanded to come to him with our needs. But none of these things compare to the reason that Jesus was walking toward Jerusalem. Because none of those things last beyond the ten minutes of our life compared to eternity. Is it possible we are consumed with little gifts rather than the greatest gift? Or that we're consumed with little gifts rather than the giver of all gifts? Jesus has given us everything. Everything that matters. Rather than wanting more and always asking for more, maybe we should spend more time recognizing what we have. If your prayer time is like our family is, then quite often it looks like, Dear Jesus, please do this and this and this and this and this and this and this. this." Amen. And I wonder if our prayer time would be better spent, Dear Jesus, I praise you for this and this and this. I thank you for this and this and this. I confess this and this and this. I'm asking for these things, but I praise you for who you are, no matter what. Sounds like his model prayer. And so, rather than asking Jesus for one more thing for ourselves, maybe tonight is a good night to come to him and say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the greatest gift that really matters beyond everything else. And then maybe saying, Jesus, what can I do for you since you've given me all things? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this evening. Lord, I thank you that we have the opportunity to open your word, that we can be taught by the disciples who have the heart that we have. Lord, that we sometimes skip past the greatest gift because we're accustomed to it, because we've heard it before because we know about it, and we jump straight to the things that we need changing in our lives right now. And Lord, I pray that this would be a lesson for us, that we need to pause, and we need to think about the fact that our Savior walked intently toward Jerusalem, knowing that he would be bearing our sin, that he would be suffering in the place that we deserve to suffer, that he would die for us, Lord, I thank you that in his death we have all things. And God, I pray that tonight, as we spend the rest of our time together, um, we would focus on who you are. And thank you for what you've done. And Lord, I pray that this would be an opportunity we have in our lives just to change ourselves a little bit so that we more often thank you and think of what you've done for us. Thank you, Lord. Love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.